Welcome to another episode of Inspirational People. I'm Jason Scott Montoya. and Today I'm joined by Chris Green. Chris, welcome. Good Glad to have you here. Uh, Chris is a co-founder and partner at Arch and Tower, a company that helps business leaders transform frustrated customers and disengaged employees into vocal advocates and loyal ambassadors under operational excellence. I recently interviewed Arch and Tower's co-founder, uh, John Hightower, your, your partner, a connection facilitated by uh, Jessica Lally International. So thank you for, for joining me. Before we dive into my questions, tell me about you, your story, and what you and your company do for others. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Jason. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast. Uh, Arch and Tower is, um, as you said, uh, a company really that partners with leaders who are trying uh, to, to go kind of further faster. Yeah. Um, and, and we do that through employee experience, customer experience, and operational excellence. Mm -hmm. Because of that, we tend to be able to kind of cover all across businesses, uh, all across a person's business, because uh, we deal with people primarily and then systems. And you know, business is literally made up completely of people and systems. So <laughs> it's been a it's been very, very fun the last few years uh, as we kind of uh, build this methodology, but also this business. And, um, but that's Arch and Tower. Uh, Chris, the person, um, I'm, I married my high school sweetheart, uh, Katie. Yeah. Uh, I chased after her since eighth grade. She finally <laughs> agreed uh, to hang with me. And that uh, was here in the Atlanta area? That was. Grew up here in the Atlanta <laughs> area. Grew up in uh, Gwinnett County, Lawrenceville, um, which was awesome. We, we lived about three miles apart and so uh, kind of got to watch her all through high school and then finally uh, ask her to to date me which is awesome yeah we, uh, went to the university of georgia together um, okay. and then and then after college uh right after college got married um we have four daughters okay um, from sixth grade down to four years old which is crazy yeah. um, well we're we're uh, not that much different i got five little ones the oldest oh is, my gosh. is almost 11 and the youngest is one and a half so <laughs> Right, right. All right. So yeah, three, so three, under... uh, three boys and two girls. So we got it mixed up. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's wild. We'll have to talk about that more uh, a little bit later. But um, yeah, and the, the person I kind of grew up with a, not a strange background, but a, an, an interesting one in that um, my parents just kind of let me follow my interests hard. And so I spent a lot of time as a kid uh, playing music, oh, okay. I spent, played a lot of time as a uh, kid playing soccer. Uh -huh. Um, uh, I loved school, so I studied a lot. So okay. I was this weird kind of kid who just creative and stuff. analytical. Is that the idea? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, when I'm kind of thinking about it, I I'm like, I'm an art, I'm an artist, but I'm a scientific artist. Like I, I see art through the lens of science more than anything. And so that, that kind of strange upbringing has really played into even who I am as a, you know, a business person because yeah. I'm such a generalist and I love to understand a lot about a lot. Yeah. And so um, anyway, uh, that, that upbringing has kind of led me to even maybe where we sit today, Jason. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So how, um, you know, like the, when you think about the business and, and your background, like how do they intersect in terms of, uh, was that out of, out of the blue or was that kind of a natural fit? I, I think so. You know, I, I think wherever you are, you probably uh, got there because of a, a, <laughs> an amalgamation of a lot of different experiences and and for me, I've always had a really keen interest in psychology and sociology. Um, never really studied them formally, but I always like found myself when I was reading articles, kind of drifting toward the articles that talked about why people behave the way they behave. Yeah. And because of that, over the last you know ten or fifteen years, um, I started pursuing personality assessments mm -hmm. and understanding the science behind them. Yeah. And then uh, while working uh, for a nonprofit here in town, uh, I started. Uh, I started a side business where I was helping like individuals with their careers okay. and then, but then I, I really wanted more to help, you know, could I be a part of sorting out their lives, uh, not yeah. fixing them, never perceived it that way as much as just saying, how, how yeah. can, how can you and I have a conversation where at the other side of that, uh, maybe you're a little better than you were when we mm -hmm. started. Yeah. And so I actually pursued that and, and built a little bit of a, a cool little business around that, which then parlayed into when we started Arch and Tower you know, bringing some of those relationships even into our company and just kind of scaling those up. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Now did, I had originally met, um, uh, uh John through, uh, the leaders, uh, the leaders, uh, uh, leaders, um, I'm now I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but it was a leadership program that we went with life work leadership. Uh, did, did you ever go through that or, or was that, uh, before your no, time? <laughs> not that program, a <laughs> yeah. couple other ones, but not that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty interesting. So before we, you know, jump into my questions, um, 
you know, I'm talking about stories and systems and living better and working smarter and what all that means. You know, we're in the middle of um, a crisis, you know, a health crisis and an economic one that are intersecting into a complex uh, scenario that we're all having to navigate and, and there is no uncertainty and as many experts as there are, you know, none of us are experts in a way. So how should we be looking at this situation um, and how might we respond to it in a healthy way? Yeah, wow, fantastic question. <laughs> uh, I think my favorite that sentence was that, uh, that none of us are experts. So I hope you're not looking to my opinion as an expert opinion. I'll tell you a couple of things I've, I've been thinking about. Um, one is when you're kind of forced to stay at home, you're kind of forced to look at all the different identities that you have. And, you know, for me, that's a uh, husband, that's father, yeah. uh, consultant, you know, in our business, um, neighbor. Uh, I mean, I'm a Christian, so I got that that I'm dealing with, you know, on this layer. But, you know, all American citizen, yeah. uh, local citizen, all those identities mm. tend to speak into like your worldview and which one, whichever one seems to be sitting at the top at that given moment. Yeah, uh, that that's the one that I've been going, okay, which voice is in my head today? <laughs> it feels like the American citizen is the one in yeah. my head today. And then today, you know, but over, you know, mid morning when my kids are going, that's around the house, not schooling, then it's, you know, it's father mm -hmm. steps in for a minute. So I think I've, I've had some, I think I've had a lot of awesome time the last couple of uh, weeks and well, a couple of months almost just thinking about, you know, those different identities and, and how to, and who I want to be and help and trying to sort out some of that stuff. Um, and, yeah, and really how, to inter, how to unify them in a way? Is that also an aspect? Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe there is that common thread between all the identities. You know, I, I worked on trying to figure some things out in my own life, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. And, you know, I came up with this idea that, okay, well, I don't, I was trying to get down to what is the irreducible minimum yeah. of like Chris Green. Like, what is that thing that no matter where I go, it's still there. And the best thing I could come up with is I just want to leave people, places, and things better than I found them. Mm. And because uh, that was that was kind of like, okay, in every situation I'm in, whether it be a COVID-19 crisis or just walking into a restaurant yeah. or hanging out with some friends, if I could just leave the environment better than I found it, well, what does that mean? Uh, like literally picking up trash. If I yeah. see trash on the ground, mm -hmm. I have this weird thing that goes, hey, that trash, it isn't yours, but it's yours. Yeah, it's yours um, to do something with, right? Yeah, there's yeah. this like idea of like personal responsibility that um, some, is somewhat of a buzzword in society, but you know, I'm, I'm taking pretty personal because I'm yeah. like, okay, well, if I'm going to leave things better than I found them, I have to take some personal responsibility yeah. for things that even aren't even mine. And, that so, starts, yeah. and even the small things make a big difference in those uh, regards. Yeah, yeah. And there's lots of philosophies out there about that, about <laughs> how, you know, like the butterfly effect. I mean, you okay. heard that one where like the, uh, the wings of a butterfly if you were to take away that tiny microscopic wind, that it would have some impact on the other side of the world. Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of yeah. philosophies around, you know, if we all just did a little bit, maybe we could have a really big impact. So. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So how does, how does the situation affect, you know, your work and the clients you're working with and, and that's, is it, are you, are you in a good spot or has it been a dramatic change for you? Uh, you know, Jason, I, I, I would describe <laughs> ourselves as very blessed. Um, we've, we've been kind of working and honing our business for the last few years. Um, we've, we've run across some incredible clients. Um, and those relationships have really held true even in this crisis. In fact, you know, because of just the generality of what we do, because we go so far across the business, mm -hmm. we find ourselves being able to, to adapt and respond um, yeah. to a lot of uh, felt needs that are happening. And so in this case, you know, a lot of the felt needs that have happened in our clients' lives have been around um, employee experience. Mm -hmm. um, and w suddenly, you know, the, the folks who are coming to work thinking a certain way are now mm -hmm. completely in a different place. Yeah. Um, and I often talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs because, you know, the quick explanation of that is, you know, the triangle where you start at the bottom and have to work your way up. And, and in that context, you know, we're all the same human beings because we all, back to that irreducible minimum idea, um, we all kind of have to, if we don't take care of our survival needs, mm -hmm. well, we're going to be stuck worrying about that forever. But mm -hmm. when we do, then we get to move the security layer, which, you know, as Americans, we tend to think about 
you know, our financial security, because that's mm -hmm. kind of what anchors us as Americans is our financial status. Yeah. <laughs> um, in other countries, the, the security layer may manifest more as physical safety. Mm -hmm. If you think about war-torn countries, when they think about security, they're thinking about, is it safe for me to walk outside of my home? Mm -hmm. And there, there are populations and, and yeah. areas in our country that feel that way as well. Yeah. Um, from, from there, you have those relational needs. You know, mm -hmm. how strong are the relationships around me? And can I build my life on the strength of those relationships? Or it's yeah. the opposite, where those relationships aren't strong. And I'm finding myself, you know, always having to watch my back because no one around me seems to be for me. Yeah. And then from there, you move up to those esteem or what we call thrive layer. Like, how do I, how do I build my, how do I build my skills? How do mm -hmm. I build my career? How do I build the things that make me who I am? And ultimately, if, if you're Maslow, you know, he, he said, you, you want to get to uh, self-actualization or I think the simple way to say that is, you know, reaching your potential. Like what yeah. is that perceived Living it potential? Out. Achievement. Living it out. Achievement. Yeah. And, and in the 90s, psychologists picked up his research because Maslow published in 42 or 43 and, uh, and then, you know, passed away and then his work kind of lived on. And then psychologists yeah. picked it back up and said, actually, we're, we're finding there's a deeper layer that mm. Maslow di uh, didn't discover. And that is actually, uh, they call it transcendence. And that's mm. helping other people achieve mm. their goals and helping other people. And maybe, maybe when I was investigating, you know, my purpose and meaning, I was sensing that in me that I want to help other people, yeah. you know, uh, leave other people better than I found them. But all that to say, in, in the context of this crisis, you know, at any given moment, your team or your friends or your family are differing places on that hierarchy. Some are living at the transcendence level. Some are living at the thrive level. Some are living at that relational level. Some are living, you know, at the security or survival level. Mm -hmm. But what happens in a crisis like that is a lot of us almost overnight get thrust down into that security layer. Yeah. And now you've got an entire population of people who are <laughs> hanging out in the same concerns. And Jason, yeah. I don't know about you, but like, this is the first time in history that I think an entire globe has been worrying about the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a really, really unique thing to kind of pull the car over and think about you know, mm -hmm. that. That's strange. So and, anyway, and, and that security. Now I think what we're starting to see is what people see as their security felt need is surfacing. And, and there's some tension there between the health crisis as the security, the financial security, or, um, or excuse me, the health crisis in terms of the physical, like you were saying, and then the, the financial, the economic. So, you know, if I'm working, you know, I'm, I work at home, um, my, my business, um, I haven't been negatively affected yet in a, in a, in a way that, that means my income is going to be causing me financial problems. Right. But there are a lot of people that are. So my, my security concern is more on the health side because that would cause an, a negative effect to me. Whereas other people, they're already feeling the, the job loss or whatever it might be. And so that's a tension that we're having to navigate as, as a globe and country and community. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we've had over 20 million people file for unemployment, which is, you know, the most in our history. Yeah. And so there will be, there will be, there will be impacts uh, downstream for all of us. Um, and I mean, you bring up the public health and financial security or economic security, that that's a really great binary that we're all kind of talking about. And if you look at yeah. social media, that's kind of the conversation <laughs> that's playing out. And it's part of my pet peeve right now, even in yeah. my own brain, is that I want, in a complex situation, you want to oversimplify things so that mm -hmm. you can understand them, right? That's just how we do it um, as human beings. And so, you know, the, the public health crisis is going to affect us on the short term and, and long term to some extent. But the economic crisis is going to affect us long term mm -hmm. um, and less on the short term. And if you don't actually weigh both of those as very, very important then yeah. uh, you're, you're going to miss something and you're going to yeah. be hurt. And I, th I think there's a, a third better way that incorporates the priorities of both, um, but allows us to move forward in a, in a way. And, and so I think through this conflict, I, I suspect that that'll happen. But, but you made the comment about, you know, the, the, the hierarchy. And one thing that I heard the other day is that the lower rungs of, you know, the first and the second rung of that, that pyramid, the businesses in that space are the ones that are actually doing really well right now. And it's the ones at the higher levels that are struggling. And like you said, it's because everyone, they fell down. <laughs> I don't know if you're, you're seeing that same thing or anything, but, but yeah. that's, that was an interesting uh, insight I learned. No, that, that's a clever insight. And, and I think what's happening there, if, you know, just my opinion is uh, most of us as human beings, and, and of course, everywhere we go, there we are. So, you know, yeah. you're a person, you go to work and you make the same decision to the same brand that you have. We're felt needs driven. 
Um, yeah. And whatever is right in front of us is what we tend to focus on. Um, and that that's both a survival mechanism, um, but it's also just the, the way our brain works, you know? Yeah. So with, with that being said, you know, you talk about businesses like Zoom. I mean, I, we're on a Zoom call right now. Uh, Zoom is meeting a felt need in society. And so yeah. you're going to see their stock, you know, increase. Um, for businesses that were doing, uh, you know, nice to haves, mm -hmm. you know, things that are felt needs when everything is good and there's no competition for your attention, then those, you'll see those businesses fall. And even with the shelter in place, you know, uh, our, our government called some businesses essential, which yeah. is uh, maybe another way of saying a felt need yeah. versus non-essential businesses, um, which is maybe another way of saying uh, maybe not a felt need. Yeah. So yeah, you kind of see it break down on those, <laughs> uh, those two binaries there. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So, um, so let's kind of shift gears a little bit and then we'll kind of incorporate some other questions into the current context, but let's talk about, you know, living better and working smarter. I think you've alluded to that a little bit in terms of what that means to you, but how, how do you go about that? How, and, and does our current context change that or does it just reinforce it? Um, you know, it's, it's an interesting dynamic, but this idea of living better and working smarter, what, is that, what does that mean to you? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question uh, because, you know, I feel like you're asking me about systems and, um, and some of that. So I'm an unstructured person, like yeah. my personality trait, yeah. you know, I'm spontaneous. I like to go with the flow. <laughs> and so a lot of the systems I have, what's your, uh, life, you, what's, what's your Myers-Briggs or disc profile? Uh, I'm an ENTJ. Okay. And I feel like whoever's listening to this is going to be judging me for that. Um, well, I'm an ENFP or ENFJ. I kind of flex between the two. Yeah. And my, and my J is a little mid range. So, <laughs> I, so you're probably uh, thinking, well, if you're a J and I'm a P, I'm more structured than you are. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm a little bit, I have that focus ability where when I really get onto something, I can get down to business. But I, I think I live most of my life kind of in this, oh, look, squirrel. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, so systems for me are, are really a way to organize my life. I, yeah. I, I lean into them almost as a way to go, hey, just help me stay out of the gutter with this, with this system. Yeah. Being at home has been an interesting thing <laughs> because my natural tendency to be boundaryless uh, has mm. really been uh, expressed um, here. So I'm actually thinking about systems when I go throughout my day a little more than I normally do. Normally they're running in the background, right? Yeah. Now they're running in the foreground for me. Like, should I get up and take a shower today? Yeah. Maybe I should get up and take a shower. Today. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't have a system and, for that yet, so I don't do it naturally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So with, with me going into an office, typically, you know, that's a part of my, my daily schedule, but also with the kids, you know, it's like, my wife usually gets up with the kids, does the lunches, and I kind of partner up with her at some point in the morning after I get ready and then take the kids to school. None of that's happening. So I'm yeah. out of that flow. So I've been thinking about systems as a way to, you know, kind of reduce misery and <laughs> increase productivity. Yeah. Um, and, but then everything in the middle, just kind of throw it away because I, I think the thing I'm worried about and what even with my wife and I'm trying to help monitor even in her world is, you know, what standard are we holding us to right now? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, is not hitting that standard making us sad um, yeah. or making us feel less good. Mm. Um, and I, I, and that's why I say, you know, maybe a system should be more focused toward reducing misery. So, you know, yeah. my health is probably falling off quite a bit. You know, I yeah. how many steps I took yesterday. And I was <laughs> frankly a, a bit embarrassed about that. Um, yeah. Whereas my wife, you know, taking walks and, and focusing yeah. on it. So that's a system she's caring about. It's one that I've kind of let go. Yeah. Um, and I, well, I'm and it is interesting because I've just seen through this, this crisis, just, um, so I, I love systems and I think they can be great, but I do think we're seeing the tyranny of, of systems and that standard that's actually backfiring um, in terms of what it was intended to do. And I think that's kind of what you're alluding to is you, you, a system needs to be for you. It can't just be something that can, you know, that, that um, oppresses you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, when you think about it scientifically, you know, you're talking about inertia, you know, the, the forward movement of something and, yeah. Um, that, that has its own mass and energy. And so for Buck that it requires an enormous amount of energy and strength mm. yeah. and discipline even. And in a time when you're just so, you know, out of sorts with uh, life and stuff, I, I tend to think, 
what are the things that are non-essential as far as those systems go so that I can go, you know, I'm not going to take that one as big of a deal. Maybe when I'm in normal circumstances, I'll take that as a bigger deal. But right now I need to just be easy on myself so that I can keep my mental health strong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think I've, I've probably just chilled out a, a bit, which is bad news for, uh, for my yeah. life probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so get up that, and do something. It's a, yeah. It's an interesting dynamic. So, so let's kind of let's shift the 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 paradigm and kind of talk about the the new the new top of the pyramid that that uh, um, was forgotten the this idea of helping others right so how do we go about helping others live better and work smarter um, whether it might be our family or coworkers or maybe we're a, a CEO or a business owner and it's our employees or maybe we're a community leader and it's the people in the community you know. What does that look like and, and what drives you to go about even doing that? I mean, why not just let everyone figure it out themselves? Ooh, that's, that's a really interesting way to think because my brain's immediately, <laughs> talk, you know, thinking, okay, how do you handle a question like that? Because you know, there's a, there's a judgmental approach like, yeah. uh, Hey, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Uh, let me help you. Uh, and then there's an overflow approach like, yeah. um, you know, man, I, I just, I, I'm feeling well, I'm feeling good. How can I overflow into someone's life? Not mm. in a judgmental way, but, uh, but in a way where I can encourage them. Um, and maybe that's where that breaks down for me a little bit. And it you know, breaks down as far as understanding it. Um, because I think what we see often are people going, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And because you're doing it wrong, let me as an expert help mm. you understand that. And, and there's, you know, I'm reading about that <laughs> you know, chronically right now. Um, and I've been pondering that, like, am I coming across to people this way. Um, and then on the other side of that is, okay, well, maybe the nuanced or healthy version of that would be a, a different type of question. Yeah. Not like you're doing it wrong. Let me help you. But maybe a, a presenting yourself as how can I help? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are you going through? What are you worrying about? You know, questions tend to create more of an exploration yeah. um, than the statements do. The statements tend to feel more like an indictment. So, you know, I, I don't know if I've been helping a lot of people. I think we've been like in a posture of helping our clients um, and, and responding quickly to felt needs with our clients. As far as friends and family, everyone seems to be sorting out the mess pretty well in my circles. I haven't felt the need to go and run and rescue anybody. Part of that's because uh, I probably have no business rescuing anybody, <laughs> but, uh, but there's uh yeah, I don't know. How, how have you been doing that? Yeah, I think, um, I think this, this, this uh, interview that I'm doing with you and with others is one way for me to do that. Go, okay. We, we're all trying to navigate this. How can I help others share their, their experience, their story, and, and that can inspire and teach others. Um, when I first, uh, when this first started to unroll, I actually did two free webinars. So I, I wrote, I've written two books. The first is called Path of the Freelancer. Yeah. And, um, and then the second is called The Jump. And The Jump is for, for small business owners that are stuck. And so I did a free webinar for freelancers and I essentially took the concepts in the book and I packed, you know, repositioned them for the current crisis, which was kind of interesting because I was like, oh, these are really relevant. Um, because what I learned was a, a freelancer is really good at freelancing because the, the, at least the ones that succeed at the business level, um, because they're expecting a crisis around every corner. And this just happens to be a larger one. So there's more at stake, but, but if you, if you understand the core of that, then that, that prepares you for this type of thing. So I did these free webinars. I put those out there. Um, I did some blog posts on like just how to navigate the situation and how to, re um, I didn't necessarily structure it the way you described in terms of the hierarchy, but that was kind of what I did, you know, take care of this need. These are the sort of priorities you need to be thinking about and how to, to reconcile those. And, and it's interesting. Um, I, I go to, you know, Gwinnett church, which is part of the North point. Uh, but th this past weekend, Andy Stanley, um, you know, mentioned this, um, uh, um, Strickland, I think it's the guy's name is Admiral, but he was a prisoner of war for seven years. And he talked about the idea of embracing the brutal facts and never losing hope that, that, um, that he would overcome the situation. And it w he talked about how the people that were overly optimistic, you know, they thought they would be free by Easter and then 4th of July, and then Thanksgiving and Christmas, and those came and went, and mm -hmm. and they actually died of a broken heart, and it kind of reminded me, um, you know, my own journey, probably about 10 years ago, I met a friend, who became, someone who became a friend, he wrote a book about these fishermen, five of them that were left, lost at sea for nine months off of Mexico, and three of them lived, and two of them died, 
and I asked him why did why did three live and two die and the three that lived um, they did what they could within the context they had so they they caught turtles they drank they drank the turtle blood they did things that were hard they had a bible they had and they would read read that to each other and and they survived they embraced those brutal facts they did the hard things and the other two they waited for rescue and they you know the other three would say hey you need to eat something you need to do something they're like no the rescue boat's coming soon i don't need to do that and they eventually died because they didn't do those things and so that's kind of a very similar thing but but um you know it's kind of thinking about what are things that i'm good at and i or that i'm already doing or i've been doing how can i do more of that so um, I just sort of ramped up things that kind of fell into those two categories um, to help others. It wasn't that I was inventing something entirely new because I think that can be challenging, especially since I am still working. Um, so I have to figure out how to how to navigate that. So does that make sense? Yeah. Well, man, what a what a gift to the world. And by <laughs> the way, I'm I'm actually the nonprofit I work for was uh, North Point, so uh, okay. I'm very familiar uh, with Andy and his teaching and yeah. Uh, uh, I think part of the the success I've had, whatever level that is, is in large part due to just those years at at North Point and to yeah. Andy. So a lot of gratitude um, toward him and the way he thinks, and mm -hmm. uh, he's really helped me sort my life out. You know, yeah. you said something, you said something kind of interesting, and it, it it makes me think about you know how people approach you know problems. And uh, I read a book by uh, Jordan Peterson. Yeah, uh, a few. 12 rules for life or I, maps I did. Meaning. Well, uh, I'm going through maps of meaning okay. now, but the 12 I, rules for life. And have you read both? I have not, but uh, I, I follow his podcast and I actually want to read yeah. maps of meaning first. So I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in that one. <laughs> yeah. Pack a lunch. It's, it's a difficult, <laughs> it's a difficult read. Um, and he's, he's very smart, which is why I tend to listen <laughs> to him. But he talks about, you know, in his clinical practice, like how, how do you teach someone to overcome really big problems? And um, and I just find it fascinating because, you know, he talks about you don't make the problem smaller. Like your yeah. role as a clinical psychologist isn't to bring someone who's hurting in and go, hey, the problem isn't big. No, it yeah. absolutely is big. Yeah. Um, and even if you think about COVID-19 and the crisis, the people who are trying to make it small are, are doing a disservice to people who are trying to heal. And mm -hmm. so he says the, the, uh, the way around that isn't to make the problem small, but make the strength of the person dealing with the problem large mm. and, and to start to equip people with the tools to deal with the big problems. Because yeah. if you make it small, the tsunami will take them over. But if you make them strong, they can stand strong when the tsunami hits them. Mm. So it's not about cowering away from your problems, but actually strengthening yourself to, to walk through them. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of heard that in even what you were what you were talking about and congratulations yeah. on writing two books. I don't think I'll ever, <laughs> I'll ever accomplish. Well, maybe like current that. version you, but maybe future you, you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Know, maybe, going back to that unstructured thing. I'll have to see if I can. If yeah. I, can I know, uh, you, you know, Simon Sinek is, he wrote oh, yeah. start with why. Yeah. So he, he literally has to hire someone to like corral him to write the book and they yeah. call him or follow up with him. Sometimes, you know, before this unfolded, they would literally be in his apartment. Like, all right, have, have you written your words yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that would be my tactic right there. So, yeah. Uh, so, awesome. so you mentioned you know a little bit of story there. So let's shift to let's talk about stories and narratives. You know, they shape our world. We love movies. We love TV. We're a creature that thrives on consuming and sharing stories, both fiction and nonfiction. So, what's a story, a parable, fable, experience that has shaped you, and and how can stories uh, inspire us during this crisis? Yeah. Wow. Well, there's a lot of stories um, that I attach to, and I'm an archetype type guy. Like I, I like to, um, in the complex things, try to simplify them with story. And I, you know, I heard someone talk about, I'd never really thought about the story of Pinocchio before, but how, um, how that was a little boy uh, who was more of a robot or, you know, under yeah. the power of someone else, a marionette, mm -hmm. right? And just the strength of trying to become your own person. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've got one of those stories and experiences in my own life. And, you know, my wife and I, we, we have four daughters, but at one time we had five. Um, and uh, we had a daughter named Hallie who uh, was born on December 19th in 2011. At the time, we only had two little girls. Um, and as a guy who's very like, you know, process information and make it very logical, you know, sometimes you have experiences that kind of transcend logic. Yeah. Um, and, and 
you don't have categories for it as an intellectual thinker. Yeah. Um, and, and I'd never seen myself as a, like, I'd never experienced any type of sadness. You know, I probably, if people were watching me as a kid going, oh, there's golden boy, you know, <laughs> pr- pretty good at everything he does. Like, you know, seems to just have everything going for him. Right. Um, and then uh, in 2011, we had this baby and I've got my perfect wife and I've got my perfect little life. And then we have this, this perfect child who has an imperfect body um, that she can't survive. Mm. Um, and so on Christmas Eve, 2011, she passes away. I mean, mm. that's, that doesn't happen to the golden boy. Yeah. You know, what is this? And so, you know, our experiences are, are very wrapped up and, and mine and my wife's experience is very wrapped up and, and just um, getting, getting understanding around that. Uh, it was the first time ever that I had to process a, a feeling that I, I'm like, oh, this is what people talk about when they say grief. Yeah. Like, what is that? Um, and, you know, going from like never really being sad to being thrown into the deep end of the emotional pool yeah. um, uh, almost instantly was, mm-hmm. was quite a journey for me. I think I had a bit of a faith crisis. I certainly had a logic crisis. Yeah. Um, I had all kinds of crises. Uh, I had health crisis around it because I was making myself sick, worrying about mm. it, thinking about it. What and, were some of the questions that were swimming around in your head um, that, that caused that crisis or that was driving that? Like well, why, you know, it, why me or, or why did this happen or, sure. or, or other things? Well, you know, in some like cosmic comic uh, role, there's the, there's the most hilarious question, which is why do bad things happen to good people? And then you have to, you have to orient yourself around, well, am I a good person? Yeah. Um, because if that holds true, then I, therefore I have to be a good or bad person. Where am I on that continuum? You know, I had to sort that out. And then I had to figure out, um, man, all, ki- all kinds of stuff, man. I mean, the faith, the faith impact was probably the hardest because if you are a person of faith, you tend to, to be taught as a kid, you know, you know, Hey, you can do all things through Christ who strength, strengthens yeah. you. Like, okay. I, I get that. Um, I, I'm not experiencing that. I don't feel I, that way I, right now. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. So, so that disconnection was, was something I had to work through. Um, so yeah, you have all that stuff, but I, I'll tell you, Jason, one of the most amazing things that happens and, you know, you see it even as the body responds to an injury, you know, there's a swelling that happens around like a broken bone. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and my wife and I experienced that with our community around us, but even, even not our community around us, you know, for whatever reason, maybe it was just the, the, the season it being Christmas time and the sadness of our story and the, the down news cycles, for whatever reason, we had a, a small little blog. We were keeping for family and friends who were tracking our story. So they didn't feel like they had to peer in on us all the time. Um, and for whatever reason, our blog went kind of viral. You know, we started getting like millions of hits on our blogs over the season. And then someone started this hashtag called Hope for Hallie. Mm. And, um, and so people started posting pictures of them holding signs saying Hope for Hallie because, you know, the world around us was swelling around our injury. Yeah. And, and, they, and they, were, they were hoping that, that Hallie could pull through her, her, her injuries. And, and people just started flooding our social media and, and our blog with these images. And I mean, we had people on Broadway in New York, whole casts wow. holding signs for us. And, you know, then we had local people, we opened our door one evening and there was this whole stack of our neighbors singing Christmas carols, people who weren't a faith, people who were a faith. It was just this gorgeous, beautiful moment of a community of people responding to someone who was hurting. Um, and so when, when you look at the, just the sadness of it, there's also this, this juxtaposition of blessing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, it's deepened, it's deepened us. Like we, yeah. we've had to uh, encounter great suffering. Um, but, but you then have context to appreciate the blessings that you have in your life. And, you know, we, we met a guy named Santa Rick, um, mm. who will be one of my favorite human beings in this process because <laughs> it was Christmas time. He, he's a great man of faith. And, and he was at the Bass Pro Shop. He was the Santa Claus at the Bass Pro Shop here in, uh, in Atlanta. And he heard about our story and he brought all these gifts to our house. And then he yeah. took this picture with, uh, with Howie that, uh, that was picked up by all these news publications. It's just a beautiful story and how he was a representation of hope for us and still stays connected with our family, still visits yeah. our kids every yeah. year. Um, so uh, if y'all can find Santa Rick, get your photo taken yeah. with him. He's, he's the best. <laughs> so anyway, that, was, that was in 2011, you said? Yeah. yeah so yeah. how has that, what have been the sort of after effects in positive way and how has it, informed how you're carrying that forward. 
Yeah. Well, because of people like Andy and at the time, you know, my boss, Billy Phoenix, who at this point is going through a really difficult challenge of his own. Um, I, I just had incredible mentors in my life who were kind of pushing me toward health because, you know, when you have these types of existential mental crises, um, they can turn into existential physical crises. And so, mm-hmm. you know, getting good uh, counseling and, and, and mentorship through these these times is really important. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. But what I, what my personal journey in that intellectually was to not be so sure of, of my freaking self, you know, yeah. because for me, it was because I'm, I'm kind of smart. I don't know where I'm on IQ. I, I'm, I don't know. Maybe I'm average. Maybe I'm a notch. I, who cares? But I think about life through the lens of intellect and, and how do I process this mm-hmm. intellectually? And now I have something that transcends my intellect and it's emotional and no matter, I can't think my way out of it. So for me, my journey is how do I let that lesson teach me um, even about small interactions? Because mm-hmm. I tend to walk into an interaction having already figured it out in my head, yeah. which makes me arrogant. It makes yeah. me, you know, like overly confident in all yeah. things I've been accused of being all throughout yeah. my life <laughs> to this day. And there's moments where that like part of me rolls its head and I got to kind of pull it back. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'd say that the most applicable and practical lesson that I'm learning on a day-to-day basis, you know, other than honoring Hallie and her memory and the strength that she had, you know, I mean, who, who gets to live four and a half days and have the impact that she yeah. got to have? I mean, that's impressive. Yeah, um, but I, I do think that humility is, is important. And, and to, to go back to Jordan Peterson, he, he um, made a comment in one of his videos. He said, um, if, you can, can, if you look at someone who's like a Nazi or a concentration camp um, guard, and you can't see yourself in them, then you don't know yourself. And this yeah. idea that we all have that potential for good, but we also have the potential for ill and evil and bad. And so we have to be willing to go, I could be wrong. I could be in the wrong. I could have done something wrong you know, here. And yeah. uh, it's not an easy thing to, to embrace that, even when you want to embrace it. <laughs> yeah. I, and that's it, Jason. And I've actually, I've followed those lectures and I've studied that because when I heard him say that um, in a soundbite, I had to go investigate how could someone come to that. And it also allowed me to position myself from a place, as you said, of humility and go, no, uh, in fact, I, I think one of his lines, even on the Joe Rogan podcast was, uh, hey, the Nazi is you. Yeah. Like, if you were there in that time, there's a very strong chance you would have also have been one. So let's not be so self-righteous about mm-hmm. you know our americans as modern or as our position as modern americans and you yeah. know that moral high ground we have because all of us as human beings have um disaster in us mm-hmm. and that we can create you know enormous pain for people mm-hmm. um, and, I, and i think a lot of you know the good that we have and that we manifest is driven by what we've inherited in that's come before us in this country and in this culture and the systems that have that have driven that right so in other words, a lot of our goodness isn't is so much that we're choosing to be good. Even a lot of it, a lot of it's just an, a, that inheritance that we're living out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, you know, Jordan talks about that a lot, you know, about just having a sense of gratitude for, you know, what we've what we're living in, because we didn't create that a whole nother group of people created that for us. Um, and even if that's not true, even if someone comes and figures out that we didn't, wouldn't you want to live from a place of going, it wasn't me? I mean, doesn't that cause you to live with a different posture where you don't, yeah. you know, where everything isn't for your consumption? I think Andy defines greed that way is, yeah. you know, thinking that everything around you is for your consumption. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, that's part of this, you know, intellectual journey is to go, can I just, even if it, even if I find out one day I'm, I'm wrong, can I at least fake myself into believing that <laughs> I didn't do any of this? Because I think that makes me be maybe a yeah. better person. Well, and I think, you know, the phrase that comes to my mind that I love is uh, standing on the shoulder of giants. Yeah. and by Isaac Newton. And, um, and I think that's what we're seeing now in this current situation with this pandemic is we're seeing all the shoulders we were standing on that are now kind of like shuffling, you know? Um, you know, it could be our food system. It could be our government. It could be our community. Um, it could be, you know, how we work. All of a sudden, these things that we were standing on, these giants we were standing on are not there and we're falling and we're having to figure out how to reconcile that. But I, I, I feel for me, it's created a lot of gratitude for those things that we often take for granted. Although I know for others, it could create bitterness. So it, it depends on how we want to like look at that situation. Yeah, yeah, totally. And you think about, you know, even Andy's line about, you know, 
there are problems to fix and then there are tensions to manage. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and being able to diagnose which, which one you're dealing with in any given moment is a really critical life lesson, yeah. and a life skill. Um, and, you know, if you're a Republican, you know, you want to anchor yourself maybe to that belief, but you need to go take a walk over to the other side for a few minutes and just yeah. hang out there and look at it from their perspective because yeah. it's going to make you a better person. Yeah. Mo most of the things we're dealing with in our families and our lives very few of them are categorized as problems to fix. I mean, maybe yeah. if you have a plumbing issue in your house, that's <laughs> yeah. a problem to fix. Yeah, but, very concrete. <laughs> yeah, but if you find yourself trying to change your spouse or change your kids, and, and, and let me tell you, when I'm looking at the lens here, I'm really looking into it, the mirror, yeah. um, because this is something I struggle with, you know, is I, I feel responsibility to craft and help people mm -hmm. get where they want to go. Sometimes I take too much responsibility for that, and I find myself coming across as a bit arrogant yeah. um, or a, too consultative with people yeah. who, <laughs> are not hiring me to consult them. Yeah. Sometimes we just need to listen, right? <laughs> no agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, probably one of my greatest struggles right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's, you talked a little bit about systems already. So let's dive a little bit more into that, you know, um, whether they're technical or human, um, you know, we are all a part of and a creator of systems. Um, there's ecosystems that we're all a part of uh, in the natural world. Um, and then these systems direct and inform us. Um, Tell us how you use them, how important they are. I mean, when I think about systems too, you know, I think about, um, you know, in, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you know, you got Iron Man and Thor and these superheroes. And Iron Man, he's, he's, not, a, he's not a super powered person. He just uses systems to give him superpowers. And I think that's how I think of systems as we can become to that potential. We can do greater things with good systems than we could on our own. So... Tell me what, tell me what else do you have to say about systems? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, this is probably a good time to talk about kind of Arch and Tower because, yeah. uh, you know, one of our partners, Ryan, he is uh, just an incredible systems creator. Um, he's incredible at a lot of things, but, yeah. uh, but that in particular, he, he seems to just be better than most at figuring out how to mm. create something that works well. And so I lean into his expertise yeah. a lot. Um, and, you know, we, we leverage Google drive as a way of file sharing. And, yeah. you know, I, I was a slow adopter to that because, <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, it was something new to understand. Some change. You know, <laughs> yeah. If you study the brain, like I, I do, it's like, uh, you know, most of most of those things that we get in the rhythm of doing um we do because our brain's trying to conserve calories and it wants to get good at a few things so that it can turn off and yeah. go into autopilot to conserve calories um and so you know it took me a while to get that system into the autopilot mode yeah but now like if you were to take google drive away from me and i think john may have mentioned you know our company was acquired late last year and they're on a whole different set of systems than we are and we yeah. came in kicking and screaming about okay. please let us keep our system. Can we just be this island in the company? Do our own thing. Like, <laughs> yeah, and they were totally cool. And so, you know, I, I'm a slow adopter to a system, but when I get in it, you know, it's like my blankie and you can't take it away from yeah. me. <laughs> um, so Google Drive is a really important system for me. Um, I, I love Adobe Suite. Um, again, you know, okay, we talked yeah. at the very beginning, I'm sure you're all about that, Jason. Um, at the very beginning, we talked about um, kind of art and science and, and so like I, I tend to create these things, these visual things that are more scientific. I love, I love drawing pretty than diagrams, not just okay. like, a, a, yeah, like I want visual. to make it pretty with some shadows and depth. And, yeah. And so like it's a scientific expression of something uh, yeah. artistic. Um, so I use Adobe Suite. I love those systems. Um, but, you know, if I fly up to like 30,000 feet and look down, um, I hate doing things twice. Mm. And so the systems I tend to gravitate toward are the systems that are functional and don't break and are reliable because I cannot stand having to take something and do it again. Do it again. I mean, talk about like a, an irreducible minimum around a pet peeve. Yeah. I wonder how you've gotten through life because that's kind of how life is. <laughs> yeah, and, and Facing the same lessons over and over. <laughs> it, it is, and maybe maybe I've gotten through it as a survival mechanism of not, yeah. category, not categorizing that same problem that I'm as having. As the same thing. As the same problem. <laughs> you know, maybe, oh, that's different. No, it's okay, it's different. Yeah, so I, can, it, I would agree. I I, it's it's almost like the things and I would say it's even, it's probably even more so the preventable things that you have to do again. Like sometimes you have to do it again because, you know, like you get your tire changed and then you run over a nail. Okay, run over a nail. Oh, but, man. but, you know, if it was something preventable, like I hit the curb and I'm the one that caused it, it's a little different, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm pretty easy on myself. And, and okay. that's, that's probably another one of my flaws. And I think that is 
is more of a not a moral decision as much as a personality wiring you know i'm just a little more risk tolerant than most okay and yeah. i think one of the backsides of that risk tolerance is that um that i tend not to have a lot of regrets about stuff so if i hit the curb i'm like well it was my time to hit the curb <laughs> yeah you know, it, i don't really cry about it that much whereas other people may beat themselves up about the expense it cost the family or themselves oh, yeah so, yeah yeah that's funny so you know I want to kind of kind of wrap things up here. You know, we um, talked a lot about systems and stories and living better and working smarter. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, life can be unfair, can be challenging. That may be true more so now than ever. Um, but it can also have contrasting moments of joy and prosperity. So as people traverse this journey of life, you know, what are your, your words of wisdom that, that you'd like to share with them to help them through this journey, especially now? Wow. Well, it's humbling that you can ask a, a guy like me to share anything. Uh, I'm, I've got a lot of quotes in my head. In fact, one of our clients, uh, there's a guy, an executive at the company who, who tends to come at me a lot in jest mostly, but there's probably a little bit of frustration behind it where he's like, you've got a one liner for everything. Um, and yeah, when you, that hang, might, you have to learn that from Andy Stanley, <laughs> you, you know what, uh, I, and if Andy ever listens to this, I'll have to, I'll have to say uh, he'll never know how much impact he's had on me and the way I think. So uh, yeah, Andy gets a lot of credit for anything I ever created. <laughs> um, but Frederick Nietzsche is someone who I've been like, not studying, but I pay close attention to because so many people get their uh, informed yeah. views from him. And, you know, he, he was a pretty dark dude. Uh, you know, I don't want to lean too much into the sorrow around him, although I think we all have that same sorrow, whether we admit it or not. Yeah. He just was a little more out front with it. Yeah. Um, but one of the things he said, and sometimes Viktor Frankl, who's someone who came after him, who gets a, a psychologist who gets a lot of credit for this quote, even though it came from Nietzsche. Um, he says, uh, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Um, and I think that's a really powerful statement, you know, mm -hmm. which, you know, said in layman's terms, if you know what you're on earth to do, it doesn't matter what you end up doing, you'll manifest that why in that context. Mm -hmm. um, Whether it's a good say, season or a bad season either, right? Yeah, you, yeah, you'll just bear fruit. You'll, you'll, you'll figure out like how to make the best of situations. But for people who don't have a why, when something happens to them, they see it that way. This happened mm -hmm. to me. But yeah. people who have a why tend to go, I'm going to happen to this. Yeah. yeah, that happened to me. I'm not mad at it. How do I adjust? Because I'm focused on something on the other side of that thing. So to me, that's a really powerful thing to ponder. You know, do you have a why? Um, and can you let that help you navigate the mess that we all have to live through? Um, the yeah, second one a, is a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just, I was going to just make a, bring up a quote. Um, I've got this book, How the Mighty Fall by Jim Collins. Yeah, Jim it's great. Collins, what a beast. Yeah. Um, but on the back of it, he's got a quote that's just exactly what you're saying, which is whether you prevail or fail, endure or die, depends more on what you do to yourself than on what the world does to you. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that as well with the, what you're saying. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Jordan Peterson said this, and uh, you'll have to forgive me. I'm sure if you <laughs> interview me in five years, I'll have another <laughs> author that I'm thinking about, a lot about. Um, <laughs> But, he, you know, he says that we as human beings should be more oriented toward our responsibilities than our rights. Mm. Um, and if you're, lis if you're listening to that quote through a political lens, you're worried about the Constitution and you're worried about socialism or capitalism. And I don't think that's what he means at all. I think what he yeah. means is don't walk around the world assuming everybody owes you something. Mm -hmm. Walk around the world going, how do I make it a better place? Which is, you know, kind of what JFK said in the late 60s, right? Don't yeah. ask, don't ask what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Man, what would happen if all of us took <laughs> that a little more seriously and carried your burden and someone else's on it? We'd be a different country. Yeah, um, I, I actually kind of, that's my expectation of how this thing is going to unfold in our country is I think the government's going to try and do a lot of things and it's going to stumble on itself. And I think individuals are going to have to take responsibility and they're, individual lives and their communities and their states um that whole idea of federalism you know and 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 because we're we're not our government our federal government is not going to rescue us from this situation they're going to be able to maybe help but there's going to be a limit to what that can do sure yeah and you know you hear people want to compare the government or companies to you know household finance like you know well why why didn't all these companies have billions of dollars in savings and you know we, we can't go into that but that's complicated and same with the government yeah you know I mean, there's some perspectives of 
you know, yeah, we have a huge national debt, which I think after our, our stimulus packages is going to be over $21 trillion now. Um, but before that, it was 17 or 18. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, yeah. oh, we're suddenly. This is dead. more of a, a the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, it's it's yeah. that extra thing. Uh, but, it, yeah, but it is yeah. interesting because I don't know if you follow Ray Dalio, but he's been posting some some content out there. In his recent one, he talked about this idea of this this debt cycle. But he actually referenced um, the, the the Torah, the Hebrew law, um, in the year of Jubilee every 50 years. Um, you know, every seven years, there's a Sabbath year and every 50 years, there's a year of Jubilee. And it's actually a system that um, addresses the debt cycle by forgiving of debts and stuff. And so that you don't have these big crashes every 50 to 100 years. So there's, it's an interesting insight kind of when you kind of think about the different ways you can approach this. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if you can think about the American economy um, as uh, household finance, just for a moment, which is already a, a bad connection, you know, you think about if you can run your debt down, uh, you do that so that when you need to go into debt, you have the margin to do that, right? Yeah. If you're living at, at your cap and then you have a crisis, then you have an existential moment, right? Yes. yes. But if you can drive your debt down and then you go into crisis, you have the margin to get in, which is, you know, what most people think, yeah. even though but what, I think what that is comes, money. Yeah. I think I that know. comes back to the humility thing that you mentioned earlier is we have to expect and understand that we will need help at some point, right? But if we think, oh, it'll never happen to me, then we'll run up that debt and never have to face that existential crisis, right? So there's a bit of arrogance, I think, that comes with that, it seems like. Yeah, and you know, and for me in my house, I won't, I won't say how everyone else should think, but for, you know, if, if I get stimulus money or, or something like that, I'm thinking about it through um, gratitude. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing it as my right. I'm not seeing it yeah. as anything. I'm seeing this as a, what a gift. Yeah. Um, and, and no matter where it really is on that continuum, uh, if we can choose to see it that way, it really changes the way that we talk about mm -hmm. it, the way we feel about it. Um, and, you know, we all think we're so smart, but ultimately we're driven by our thoughts. And if we can if we just <laughs> change our thoughts, you really can change your behavior. And our vocabulary shapes a lot of our behavior as well. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, second quote, I just want to share really quickly. Uh, that, that I've really been thinking about is another Nietzsche quote. And it says, um, there are no facts, only interpretations. Mm. Um, and for me, that's one that I try to internalize because I'm a facts guy. Give me the facts. Uh, yeah. Don't give me your emotional uh, opinion okay. on that. So, uh, but everything has to be interpreted is what you're saying. Well, yeah. And, and that's probably coming from a place of, uh, for Nietzsche of a place of thinking that there probably are no absolute truths. You know, I don't think he was a man of faith at all. Um, and so for him is what you see is what you get. Um, and so absolute truth is a little bit of a, a farce to him. So yeah. when you, when you feel, but I think there, there's a good lesson inside of that because I think that there, he's not all that wrong. There probably are a lot fewer absolute truths than all of us are willing to admit. Mm -hmm. And if, and if you can, if you can own that, or at least suspend your thinking to live in that thought for a minute, then all the stuff that you're hunkering down on and, and, and really fighting for, uh, maybe you should chill out a little bit because yeah. all I have to do is give you a different set of experiences, <laughs> a different childhood, a different set of parents, maybe a different geographical location or a different country. And I'm pretty sure you would feel far yeah. differently than yeah. you do today. And if that's true, then Jason, why is it so hard for us to pry our fingers off our worldview? Like why? I mean, that's something that really is grating on my own soul as I go, yeah. why is it so hard for me to pry my fingers off my worldview if that were true. Anyway, yeah, I don't know how you to would be able to let that, that go. Yeah, I think I think a lot of that's because um, because when you get to that core of that of what we believe in our identity, um, it's it's very vulnerable. We're very naked to to shed that thing and then be left bare to whatever it is that's out there. And yeah. and it might be kind of like what you said, a bit of a security blanket to some to some degree. Um, that we're, we're an unwilling or unable to sort of stand in the heat or, or stand in the fire of, of what that entails. Yeah. 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 Profound. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's come to mind. So anything that you wanted to share that we, we didn't get to in, in the discussion so far? I think we covered some fun. I'm <laughs> satisfied. <Thank you. laughs> well, that's great. Cool. Well, um, thank you for sharing um, your insights. You know, how can people connect with you? Um, what are you up to? People want to work with you? You know, what, Give us, give us the download on that. 
Yeah, well, if anybody wants to work with me after that mess, uh, <laughs> then uh, that's great. Now, archandtower.com is our website. Uh, you can reach me at chris at archandtower.com. Uh, yeah, and we, we just love meeting people. We have clients who, um, who don't even need uh, business work as much as just personal work. And we find ourselves having similar conversations that you and I just had. It helps people kind of sort out you know, them versus their business. And we do that with some founders actually yeah. right now, people who have created something really magnificent, but you know, at some point in their scale, they have a hard time figuring out which, uh, is this business me? Am I the business? And what are, where are the boundaries between those two? I mean, we, we've done stuff all the way from that for small business owners, all the way up to working with huge, you know, 10 plus billion dollar companies. So, and we find that most people know where they want to go. They just, they just need a guide to help them navigate the side streets. Yeah. Um, because that's where people tend to get lost, right? You know, they yeah, know the interstates distracted. to take. <laughs> yeah, they know the interstate to take. There's a wreck on the interstate and they don't know the side streets on how to get around that wreck. And so that's really where our company tends to help people is we, we just have the knowledge and experiences. And if we don't, we find them to help yeah. leaders get where they want to go. Pretty simple. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, are you on, I assume you're on LinkedIn. Um, the website's archandtower.com, right? Yep. All that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah, put links yeah. on the, on the post so people can, can check that out. Um, anything, any other links, you, I need a, any other social channels, Are you on Twitter or anything else like that? Uh, not on Twitter. Um, funny place to be. Uh, we yeah. do have a resource called need to lead.com, which is cool where we, we, we've packaged up some of our closest hospitality and service excellence friends like, um, Horst Schulte from the Ritz Carlton and uh, Jason okay. Young. Yeah. And so there's a, you can check out need to If you want to just kind of peruse around some other types okay. of yeah, put that on. masterclass style. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it being here. Good conversation. Thank you.